lots of times people come to me and they have relationship problems and part of the problem is is that they've set their relationships up outside of social norms and they do that you know so they'll say something to me something like well we're not going to get married because marriage is just a piece of paper which is really a stupid thing to say like it's an incredibly stupid thing to say but underneath that there's this idea that they want to remain free of social constraints so that they can negotiate their own way. Like if you're giving them credit for, you know, wanting freedom instead of just escaping responsibility. But the problem with that is, it's like, okay, good luck. Try it. I, I don't know why you would assume that you have enough time in the 30 or 40 years that you're going to be pursuing relationships to actually figure out how they should run. You don't have a hope of that. And it's worse, too, because very, very few people can negotiate. You know, because the, the, here's the way it works. You either adhere to the social order or you stand outside of it. As soon as you stand outside of it, you're in a chaotic place because there's no guidelines. And then you either live chaotically because there's no guidelines or you start <clears throat> to formulate order. But to do that, you have to know what you want. And you have to know how to express it. And then you have to figure out what your partner wants and help them express it, and then you have to negotiate a solution. Well, I would say one in 20 people know how to negotiate. It's really, really difficult. I mean, just think of the steps. First of all, you have to know what you want, and then you have to admit it to yourself. Well, yeah, right. Like, you're not even going to get to the first one in all likelihood. What do you want? A lot of what you want can't be articulated even, you know. I'll give you an example. So there's a great study done a while back on the prediction of, mer of, of uh, relationship longevity. Okay, so here was the question. Um, how many negative interactions do you have to have per set of positive... Sorry. How many positive interactions per negative interaction do you have to have with your partner in order for the relationship to remain stable? Okay, so let's say you have one negative interaction to every one positive interaction, okay? Or maybe you have 10 negatives to every positive. Then you can imagine a different situation where you have 100 positive to one negative, right? Spanning the whole potential continuum. And you use that to predict relationship satisfaction and longevity. Well, you might think, well, God, obviously 100 positive to one negative is where is the preferable ratio. And so it's those people who, you know, their relationship is nothing but constant compliments and bliss. They're the ones who last. It's not true. What you see is that there's, a, there's a, an, optimal, an optimal ratio domain. If it falls below 5 to 1 positive to negative, then your relationship falls apart. It's too negative. And it's partly because people feel negative emotion more than they feel positive emotion. Because you can be hurt more than you can be pleased. And so, uh, one that's only five to one is too punishing. And people won't, won't stay in it. But if you get above 11 to one, it gets not punishing enough. And you think, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, what do you want in a relationship? Well, you think, bliss. It's like, that isn't what you want, as it turns out. It's more like you want someone to contend with. You know, you don't want to push over. You don't want everything just to be easy. You know, and this is the sort of, um, the sort of phenomenon that Kierkegaard was talking about when he talked about deciding to make things more difficult for people because that's what they need. You know, you know this perfectly well because if you go out with someone and they worship you and they dote on your every word and there's nothing but positive feedback coming from them, you lose respect for them almost instantly and you go wander off and find someone who's more interesting. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that you want the person that you're with to challenge you so that not only do you do reasonably well day to day, day together, you know, so that you can coexist in the same space with a reasonable amount of peace, but you also want there to be enough tension in the relationship so that you're both involved in a process of mutual transformation. Well, try specifying that in an articulated way. You know, good luck. You know, and it also it explains strange things about people, like the fact that they'll stay in pretty negative relationships. Like, what the hell are you doing there? If you'd articulated it two years ago and you said, well, I want to be with someone I'm miserable with half the time, of course, you're never going to say that, but it could easily be that that's what you're after. So, 
Well, so, all right. Now, Heidegger is another philosopher who was attempting, in some sense, to solve the problems that were laid out by Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. And the way that Heidegger, Heidegger it began to resolve them was by taking a radically new look at philosophy itself. And he was, he, was, he was one of the prime phenomenologists. And I told you a while back that the phenomenologists decided to reconstitute Western philosophy so that it was focusing on being instead of knowledge. And so the hardest thing to grasp about the phenomenologists is what exactly they meant by being. And, and so I'll give you a... I'll give you uh, an overview of that. So that's where the term Dasein comes from, and that's a German term, and it means being there. And so right now you're encapsulated in a Dasein, and the Dasein is the totality of your experience. And that experience would be an experience of the extended world, the natural world, and then the social world, and then inside that, the world of your subjective experience. And that constitutes being. And the phenomenologists make the case. They're not playing the subject-object game. They're standing outside of the division between subject and object that's part of the scientific worldview. So it's a real paradigm shift in that you can't use the rules from the old way of looking at things inside the new way of looking at things. You have to start with new presuppositions. So we might say, well... One of the things that you're going to do if you look at things phenomenologically is to assume that everything that you experience is real. So, so then we would say that there's no attempt in a phenomenological world to reduce pain to something material. Pain stands, as, stands itself as a phenomenon. So does anxiety, so does joy. All the things that the scientists of consciousness call qualia which are viewed by them as qualities of the objective world, aren't viewed that way by the phenomenologists. They just say those are primary elements of being. So it's a very interesting way of looking at things because it kind of allows you to reclaim the validity of your own experience. You can no longer say, well, that's only subjective. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you claim subjectively is true, objectively or for other people. What it does mean is that everything that you experience subjectively is real. Now that doesn't mean you, you have to not think about it or take it apart or categorize it properly. You still have to do all of those things. But you're, you're put into a place where there's no need to deny the reality of your own experience or to subordinate it to something else. So, for example, if I'm doing dream analysis with someone, which I do often if people dream, because dreams, as Jung pointed out, are they're, they, they're, they're manifestations of being. You don't come up with them. They appear to you. They sort of appear out of nowhere in some sense. They manifest themselves. They, they, they do it strangely, and I think the reason for that is that they contain unarticulated thought. But if you can get a handle on them and... and assess them, then sometimes they can tell you things that there's no other way you'd figure out. And what's really cool about them is that they're, they have the same impersonality as phenomena in the, like the broader world of experience have. You know, you don't ever think about the truth of a chair. It's just there. And dreams are like that. They're just there. And if you can untangle what they have to, what they indicate, then you can get a take on your own experience that's not altered by any of your local subjective wishes and desires. I hate to use the word subjective in this sort of context. So, phenomenology is the study of being. Now, now and in being, there are a variety of aspects. And so, one aspect, I, I never remember the names of these, but I'll get it here right away. Oh, yes. Uh, Heidegger broke the world of experience being into three basic categories. There was the umwelt, which I think is basically the world beyond culture and the individual. There's the mitwelt, and that's the world that we share with everyone else. So that's roughly the social world and the social structures. And then there's the eigenwelt, which is 
that domain of experience that's unique to you, that other people can't partake in. So those are the elements of being as far as the phenomenologists were concerned. And in those domains of being, different experiences manifest themselves. We talked about some of the ones that would be manifestations of the Eigenwelt. Scientists would call those things emotional or motivational states. Normally people think of them as feelings, I would say. I feel thus, I feel such and such. And those are experiences that, that manifest themselves to you or that you have, depending on how you look at it, that are indicative of the manner in which you should act in relationship to being. Now, one of the, part of the reason that this is relevant to psychotherapy in particular was because the, the, uh, the phenomenologists were very interested in the manifestation of meaning. So you could say, well, nihilism is the absence of meaning, and totalitarianism is the fixedness of meaning, right? If you're a totalitarian, what you do is say, all meanings exist in relationship to this structure. It's almost as if from the phenomenologists would say you're trying to reduce the, the umwelt, which is the natural world, the mitwelt, which is the social world, and the eigenwelt, which is your own world. You're trying to reduce all of that to the mitwelt so that everything falls under an explanation that's granted to you by some higher authority. And... And then, of course, the nihilists are, are having none of that. They, see, they, they, they use their eigenwelt, I would say, their own world, to invalidate meaning in any domain. Now, the phenomenologists would say, well, it's a mistake to use your rationality to undermine the, the, the sense, the manifestation of meaning. And I, I can give you an example of that. So let's say you're a good nihilist and you think that maybe you're going to go do something difficult, like put yourself through university, and then you think, in a relatively depressed state of mind, maybe you encounter some obstacles of one form or another, and you think, oh, to hell with this. Who's, what difference does it make anyways? Who cares if I go and get my degree? You know, None of this knowledge is particularly relevant or meaningful, and who the hell is going to know the difference in a million years? And so you think, well, that's a perfectly rational um, dismissal. Because who is going to know in a million years? Or, or let's say, well, even if you could make a case that someone might know, there might be some effects left of you in a million years, then we'll just multiply it by 100,000 and go to a trillion years. So here you are, you're this little tiny speck on a slightly bigger speck in the middle of a galaxy that has God only knows how many billion stars. And then there's a billion of those galaxies, although there's way more than that. And they're spread across this tremendous expanse of time. And in the face of all that, who cares what you do? Well, what a phenomenologist would say is, okay, <clears throat> let's look at how meaning manifests itself when you alter your own private world in a variety of manners. So let's say you're trying to do something. Maybe you're working, in a, maybe you're working as a volunteer in a hospital helping sick kids. You know, you're reading to them so that they're distracted from their pain. And you say, well, in a trillion years, who's going to know the difference? And so you think, well, it's meaningless to do this. And the phenomenologist would say, if the frame of reference that you're using, like if you're, if you're imposing, if you're transforming the way your being manifests itself so that it becomes meaningless and absurd, then you should try experiencing it in a different manner. So it's a, see, because a rationalist, in some sense, the phenomenologists say, a rationalist can't deal with the argument, what difference is it going to make in a trillion years, and here you are, a little dust speck among all these other dust specks. It's ultimately meaningless. A phenomenologist would say, maximize the meaning. That's the, that's the marker of truth. And it's a, it's a completely different way of thinking about it. So he, he would say, for example, that if you're going to a hospital and you're reading to sick children, that the frame of reference that you should use, the way that you allow that experience to manifest itself, should 
be such that the experience manifests itself so that it's as meaningful as possible rather than as meaningless. The idea being that just because you can twist your own experience so that certain elements of your being become meaningless does not mean that that's right. The fact that it becomes meaningless actually means that it's wrong. Because you think, you see, it all depends on what you allow to be primary, and this is the phenomenologist's point. If you allow your strict rationality to be primary, then if it can attack something and destroy it, then that thing is worthy of being attacked and destroyed. But if you flip it around and you say, well, what you should be doing is allowing, is interacting with your experience or allowing your experience to manifest itself in a manner that situates you most meaningfully in the here and now, whatever framework you're using to do that, that works, is right. Well, it's a completely different way of looking at things. And it's a real, it's a real escape from the pathology of rationalism. You know, because it isn't obvious that what you think should take priority. Now, the phenomenologists would go farther than that. They would say that, and this is something... So here's a way of thinking about it. So Binswanger said, what we perceive are first and foremost... Binswanger was a psychiatrist who was very much influenced... Binswanger and Boss were the people we're going to talk about mostly. We're very much influenced by Heideggerian ideas. They say... What we perceive are first and foremost not impressions of taste, tone, smell, or touch, not even things or objects, but meanings. Okay, so the idea for the phenomenologists is that what being is made out of is meaning. It isn't that the objective world is made out of things, it's that being is made out of meaning. Now, some of those meanings can be positive, and some of them can be negative, and some of them can be neutral. But the fundamental constituent elements of being the fundamental constituent element of being is meaning. And then there is an argument between Binswanger and Boss about how that meaning manifests itself. So Binswanger would say that you endow meaning on the world. So that's kind of a Nietzschean idea, that you create your own values. So that you have within you something he called an a priori ontological structure. It's a world design or a matrix of meaning that determines how the world manifests itself to you. Now, the easiest way to think about that is that, you know, you're thrown into a particular time and place. That's another existentialist idea, and that's part of the absurdity of your life, is that you're here, now, in this particular context and situation. It's something you have to contend with, and that's true for everyone. There are arbitrary preconditions to everyone's being, and one of those arbitrary preconditions is the structure through which you look at the world. And that structure enables some things to be highlighted and some things to be ignored. And so the way that meaning manifests itself is a reflection of this a priori ontological structure, the a priori mode of being. So there can't be being, which is, say, your experience for the sake of our argument, without the structure that consists of you, that, that you consist of. And so that's a given. And it's, it's the action of that structure that determines the meaning of things. 